on World News Tonight. Overflowing borders. Poland struggles with waves of immigrants as Belarus comes under international scrutiny. Drowning nation. India faces Mother Nature's fury as the latest flooding calamity. Grim milestone. Infection surges Europe struggles with record-breaking COVID tolls. Lights for change. Artists display gorgeous works of art with a twist of climate awareness. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with a migrant crisis. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen called on member states to impose new sanctions against Belarus, which she blamed for an influx of Im immigrants at the Polish border. With just a shovel in hand, this man tries to break down a barbed wire fence before being repelled. Here near Kuznica at the Belarus border, hundreds of migrants are seeking to cross into Poland but they've been refused entry by the country's army. According to Warsaw, these migrants were deliberately sent to the eastern border of the European Union by the Belarusian regime, with one objective, to undermine the European Union. This is a continuation of the desperate attempt by the Lukashenko regime to use people as pawns to destabilize the European Union and, of course, the values that, that we stand for. And we uh, have repeatedly, firmly rejected attempts to instrumentalize people for political purposes. For several months, hundreds of migrants have gathered at the border, leading to growing concern by Poland and NATO of a possible escalation and major incident. Polish authorities have responded by deploying thousands of soldiers, laying barbed wire fencing and declaring a local state of emergency. As winter approaches, the pressure on the ground is also taking its toll. Faced with a lack of food and medical supplies, at least 10 migrants have already died in the region. Belarus, for its part, has denied weaponizing migrants against the EU, instead blaming the West for the crossings. In response, Brussels says it's now preparing to implement sanctions against the regime. The subject will be one of the key points up for discussion next week in a meeting of the Union's foreign ministers. Despite the ambitious targets agreed to by countries at the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, new reports show there's a huge gap between what nations declare as their emissions and the amount they are actually pumping into the atmosphere. As criticism mounts over the lack of substantial progress at the UN Climate Summit, the Washington Post is reporting that the emission reduction pledges made by countries were built on flawed data. It says a team of experts have looked into reports submitted by 196 countries. The investigation, it says, found many had undercounted their greenhouse gas emissions. It adds there was an enormous gap ranging from at least 8.5 billion to as high as 13.3 billion tons a year of underreported emissions. For instance, the data submitted to the UN by Malaysia shows the country's annual emissions at just 81 million tons, less than Belgium, due to its forests and jungles that consume vast amounts of CO2. However, data compiled by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization indicates Malaysia actually released 422 million tons of greenhouse gases in 2016, placing it among the world's top 25 emitters. The Washington Post also found that methane emissions make up a second major portion of missing greenhouse gases in the UN database. It adds that countries are undercounting methane emissions of all kinds, ranging from the oil and gas sector to agriculture and human waste. Moreover, the report points out there are fundamental problems that lead to the gap, noting how developed countries have one set of standards, while developing nations have another. It also says some 45 countries, including Algeria and Libya, have not reported any new greenhouse gas numbers since 2009. Former U.S. President Barack Obama lambasted those who would play politics to avoiding acting on climate change, calling out Russia and China and Republican politicians back in the United States. Paris showed the world that progress is possible, created a framework, important work was done there and important work has been done here. That is the good news. Now for the bad news. We are nowhere near where we need to be yet. 
former U.S. President Barack Obama on Monday gave a scalding review of the global climate change response. Speaking at the COP26 summit in Glasgow, Hello, Glasgow, Obama lambasted those he says play politics to avoid reaching climate targets. There is one thing that should transcend our day-to-day -day politics and normal geopolitics, and that is climate change. He called out Russia and China for not doing enough. I have to confess, it was particularly discouraging to see the leaders of two of the world's largest emitters, China and Russia, decline to even attend the proceedings. And their national plans so far reflect what appears to be a dangerous lack of urgency, a willingness to maintain the status quo uh, on the part of those governments. Obama then zeroed in on U.S. Republicans at home, blasting them for blocking climate ambitions, including Democratic President Joe Biden's agenda. Both of us have been constrained in large part by the fact that one of our two major parties has decided not only to sit on the sidelines, but express active hostility toward climate science and make climate change a partisan issue. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat. If your Florida house is flooded by rising seas. Obama said he is convinced that Biden will get Congress to pass a bill to spend $555 billion on climate change. It's urgent, Obama said, highlighting little progress made since the 2015 Paris Agreement was reached to try to curb warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Vote. The former president told youth activists to keep fighting. Vote like your life depends on it because it does. I recognize that a lot of young people may be cynical about politics. But the cold hard fact is we will not have more ambitious climate plans coming out of governments unless governments feel some pressure from voters. It's the youth, Obama said, who have the most at stake. Heavy rains in India's southern Chennai city crippled normal life as several areas were waterlogged, prompting authorities to issue warnings and evacuate people from low-lying areas. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar reporting from Delhi in India. For more, Gayatri. Yes, Shenali. Local media showed footage of cars submerged under water of rooted trees and people being rescued on rubber boats in various parts of Chennai, the largest city in southern state of Tamil Nadu and often called India's Detroit due to its large car making industry. People waded through severely waterlogged streets to reach their destinations. Water entered their homes, damaging property and depriving residents of necessities. India's meteorological department has said that heavy rains were expected to continue for the next four days in different parts of Tamil Nadu, the southern Andhra Pradesh state and the Union territory of Pondicherry. The rains will continue as low pressure is created by a cyclonic circulation in the Bay of Bengal. The 2015 floods triggered by incessant rains had submerged parts of Tamil Nadu including its capital Chennai and killed over 200 people and displaced many. India with 1.3 billion people relies on rainfall to support its population, many of whom live rely on farming. But excessive rainfall can cause floods, landslides and waterborne diseases. Back to you Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Sadhadar Naval News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar reporting from Delhi in India. Countries around the world continue to face a variety of climate change threats and extreme weather events, while parts of China saw snowfall weeks earlier than expected. Venice was once again submerged in water. China's capital, Beijing, welcomed the first snow of the year over the weekend. The blanket of snow came 23 days earlier than has been seen in other years. State media reported that buses were suspended and highways were closed due to the heavy early season snow. The early winter chill adds to concerns over China's efforts to fight climate change. As unusual weather patterns continue across the globe, China is rushing to burn more coal amid its own energy crisis. The floating city in Italy, Venice, was once again submerged in water. Tourists waded through the St. Mark's Square with waterproof covers over their shoes. The city was hit by unseasonably high waters, which scientists say are caused by rising sea levels and unusually high tides. 
People are taking to the streets in the UK, the country hosting the UN climate conference, as well as parts of Europe, to demand immediate action against climate change. 10 years, 20 years, we can do a lot of damage in 20 years. It needs to be now. It can't be 10 years, 20 years, it has to be now. Droughts on top of post-pandemic supply chain issues have also led to a surge in global food prices. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, the food price index rose at an annual rate of 31 percent in October. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Chinese President Xi Jinping, the uncontested leader of the world's most populous nation, hits a pivotal plenary of the ruling party's top figures that will set the tone for his bid for long-term rule. China's Communist Party is set to issue a resolution officially reassessing the party's 100-year history, which will also likely extend President Xi Jinping's rule. The move will also cement his status in China's history books alongside former leaders like Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping. And the Chinese government's newest official history shows the impact the Chinese leader had. According to the New York Times on Monday, the party's official history, which covers the 100 years of its Communist Party, is 531 pages long, of which over a quarter of it is dedicated to the nine years she has been in power. The 68-year-old is known as being the country's most powerful leader in decades, having also won widespread public support for attacking corruption, reducing poverty, while projecting China's strength to the rest of the world. However, critics note his early mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic and the rising tensions with the U.S. Despite this, the soon-to-be-passed resolution will certainly further raise Xi's status in the country moving forward. Now on to the updates of the COVID crisis. Global COVID-19 cases surpassed 250 million as some countries in Eastern Europe experienced record outbreaks, even as the Delta variant surge eases and many countries resume trade and tourism. As many countries begin to lift COVID-19 restrictions and welcome back tourists, a fresh wave of infections is sweeping through Europe. The surge was most evident in the East, where countries such as Ukraine, Greece and Croatia saw their incidence rates jump to over 500 daily infections per 100,000 inhabitants. In Russia, a nationwide workplace shutdown was lifted Monday, despite the country averaging 1,000 COVID-related deaths a day since mid-October. And in Western Europe, the UK and Belgium also saw their incidence rates top 500 in recent weeks leading the Belgian health minister to warn of a difficult winter ahead. Cases were also on the rise in Germany, where the incidence rate topped 200 for the first time since the start of the pandemic. Neighboring Austria, meanwhile, introduced a slew of restrictions for the non-vaccinated on Monday in an effort to encourage more people to get jabbed. Infections were also rising in France, albeit at a slower rate than for most of its neighbors. All eyes will now be on Emmanuel Macron, who is set to address the nation over the health crisis on Tuesday. With the vaccination rates increasing each day and with more countries opening their borders for fully immunized travelers, vaccination has become a norm for all those who wish to travel without being subject to strict COVID-19 restrictions, especially in France. For more on this, let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting now from Normandy in France. Chetana. Yes, Chanel. Similar to other European Union and Schengen area countries, France requires all travelers to hold at least a vaccination certificate to be permitted restriction-free entry to the country. However, the country recognizes only a limited number of vaccines. According to the French Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs, in order, to, in order for a traveler to be considered fully vaccinated when reaching France, the vaccination certificate should indicate that the holder has been fully immunized against COVID-19 disease with Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Moderna, J&J or Covishield. Regarding the vaccination certificate requirement, the authorities have noted that the document should prove that at least seven days have passed since the last dose for a two-shot vaccine has been taken. Previously, France decided to extend its health pass requirement until July 2022, 
This means that the, everyone who reaches the country needs to hold the pass until mid-2022 to be permitted access to several indoor spaces like restaurants, bars, shopping centers and hospitals, among others. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was at the Delano World News Special Correspondent Chetan Dharma Ratna reporting from Normandy in France. At JFK Airport in New York, passengers ran into the arms of eagerly waiting loved ones for a series of emotional reunions the day the U.S. East travel restrictions that had been imposed on much of the world. Tears flowed, cameras flashed, and airline officials applauded as loved ones were reunited Monday at New York's John F. Kennedy International Airport. It's been so emotional and it has for millions of families all over the world, but this is the best thing that's ever happened to us. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you so much to everybody. Siblings, parents and children hugged and cried, and new grandmothers met babies for the very first time. After the United States opened its borders to vaccinated international travelers, lifting restrictions that barred much of the world from coming to the U.S. for more than 20 months. Look at him, it's just, there's no words. You can't describe, what, how do you describe this feeling? You know? Yeah, look. Such a joy, you know. Bhavna Patel was on the first New York bound British Airways flight leaving Heathrow once the ban ended, eager to meet her one year old grandson Kai. There's no words. I don't have any words. For nearly two years, the unprecedented restrictions have prevented families from gathering in person to celebrate weddings, grieve at funerals, or welcome new babies. It, it felt amazing to see them hugging and holding hands. And Patel's son, Kushal, said the family will spend their 10-day visit making up for their time apart. I know how much it means to me to be able to hold him and having them not be able to do that. Uh, it's been really painful, so this, I'm so glad it happened. I'm so glad it's real. It's just, it's amazing. It's, yeah. We have some good news for you. The World Health Organization and the United Nations Children's Agency kicked off a polio vaccination campaign in Afghanistan, the first nationwide campaign to fight the disease in three years. A polio vaccination campaign kicked off in Afghanistan on Monday, the first in three years. The campaign, run by the World Health Organization and UNICEF, aims to reach over three million children. The WHO said it had received Taliban backing which would allow teams to reach children in previously inaccessible parts of the country. But hurdles remain. Trained staff are in short supply. Polio vaccinator Hasib Allah Kaderi says resistance from families is another challenge. We didn't receive the polio medicines on time, and most of the families refused to vaccinate their kids because there were rumors that this polio vaccine may harm their children. These are the issues we're facing. Afghanistan and neighboring Pakistan are the last countries in the world with endemic polio, an incurable and highly infectious disease transmitted through sewage. It can cause crippling paralysis in young children. Polio has been almost eradicated globally through a decades-long inoculation drive. But insecurity, inaccessible terrain, mass displacement and suspicion of outside interference have hampered mass vaccination in both countries. Several polio workers were killed by gunmen in eastern Afghanistan this year, though it was not clear who was behind the attacks. According to WHO figures compiled before the collapse of the Western-backed government in August, there was one reported case of wild polio virus type 1 in Afghanistan in 2021, compared with 56 in 2020. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Four of 40 infants in the newborn care unit of the government hospital died in central India when a fire swept through the building. The latest is a string of hospital fires in the country this year that have killed dozens. A NASA live broadcast shows a SpaceX capsule carrying four astronauts back to Earth after a busy six months on the International Space Station landed off the coast of Florida. New Zealand beefed up security measures at its parliament as thousands of people gathered to protest against COVID-19 vaccination mandates and government lockdowns. 
violence. Mostly unmasked protesters marched through the center of Wellington and congregated outside parliament. Nicaragua's President Daniel Ortega easily locked in a fourth consecutive term after suppressing political rivals, leading the U.S. to warn of possible sanctions and press for free and fair election. French Catholic bishops agreed to sell a part of the church's extensive real estate holding to compensate of thousands of victims of child sex abuse at the hands of clergy. And finally tonight, the Field Oslo Light Festival lit up the city streets with this year's theme focusing on the environment. Nobel Peace Centre, which every year promotes reflection around important topics, lit up by artist Hotaro Vishwa Guerrilla and the installation called Trans Nature. The biggest installation is The Abyss by French lit artist Nicolas Paolozzi, which was inspired by animals living in the deep ocean. The work Monad, made by the founder of Fjord Oslo Light Festival, Anastasia Lastian, reflects on the rhythm of the universe, birth, life, death and rebirth. Gaia is a lit up globe by British artist Luke Jerome, which has the intention of giving you a view of the world as if you were an astronaut. The outdoor installations are on display around the central Oslo for three nights. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.